So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field. But we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archer shot at your servants in the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, thus shall you say to Joab, do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and pray before we get started. God, I thank you for your word and that we have the privilege to come here tonight uh, and to, to learn from it, to speak about it freely and openly. I pray, Lord, that you would give my, my words clarity, uh, that you would help me to present the accuracy of your word. I pray tonight, Lord, that we would experience your grace and, and just the, the beautiful gift to be able to have your word, to follow you and to know you and your son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray, amen. So if you guys have a U version, you can also pull that out. Um, I have on there uh, some notes for you to follow along with. Um, you will see a title on there. Last minute, I've kind of decided to scratch that title out because I don't feel like it was really conveying the real purpose of the story. And so the new title of it is what I've, uh, what I've been reading is Saving King David. That's kind of the title um, that I decided to go with. Because really what we have here is a rescue mission. It's a story of a king who was so victorious in his early years of life and now has fallen and has been defeated by sin. And I thought, that is an accurate title. Have any of you guys seen Saving Private Ryan? Yes. Is that not the greatest war movie of all time? Yes. It is really good. Yeah, I love it. It's an awesome story. But it's about a bunch of soldiers uh, over in Normandy who are sent on a task by upper like commanders and, and generals to save this man named James Ryan because three of his brothers had passed away. So they're sent on this mission behind enemy lines to save this guy. And the whole question of the film is like, why should we go out to save this one dude? Why risk six people's lives to save one guy? Doesn't anybody else deserve to be saved? Don't we all deserve a ticket back home? <clears throat> In the same way I'm looking at this, and this story is really about how God is going to save King David from his sin. Uh, I remember in youth group, in the first couple of years of my high school experience, I had a youth leader. He was awesome. He was the Secret Service guy. Um, he used to work on the White House. He was a sniper on the roof, actually. And he was just a brilliant and wonderful storyteller. He would walk us through all of First and Second Samuel and, and, and Judges and Ruth, and he just really brought the stories to life. I mean, First Samuel is an exciting adventure. It's full of political intrigue, romance, brutal warfare, betrayal, camaraderie. There's witches in it, crazy kings, epic battles. It's a sweeping epic. If you guys haven't read, I really encourage you. But the story of King David is one of such encouragement when you read 1 Samuel. You see, David was a young shepherd boy, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, who was the son of Ruth and Boaz, as Nathaniel was preaching last week. After God rejects Saul as king, so after the time of Judges, right, everybody wanted a king. They said, we want to be like other nations. We want a king. And so God said, fine, you can have that after much resistance. They eventually decided to choose Saul as king, but he disobeys him. He disobeys God constantly, so God tells him, you're going to lose your throne, and he's going to pick a new king, a king who's after his own heart. <clears throat> so God sends Samuel to this man named Jesse, who has eight sons. Seven sons are, are all rejected by God. He says, I'm not looking on the outside, I'm looking at the inside. I'm looking for someone after my own heart. And of course, there was that one kid uh, that was off tending sheep, this young, ruddy-looking dude, and the shepherd boy who wasn't really even considered by most to be worthy of such a role. But nonetheless, that's the one that God chose. So you see, David starts from very humble beginnings, just a, just a shepherd boy. And then he's chosen by God, anointed to be king. Of course, he doesn't get the kingdom immediately. It takes time. And God's going to test him. And he's not going to simply provide the kingdom right away. Instead, he's enlisted under Saul as his armor bearer and also as one who plays the lyre. Because Saul was tormented by the spirit because he had disobeyed God and had, had, had forfeited his kingdom. But notice David's is humble. Right? He doesn't try to usher in his kingdom forcibly. He comes in there, and he, he serves Saul lovingly and gracefully, even after Saul gets jealous of David. You can see, there was one time when the Philistines and the Israelites were in a battle, and they were in a standstill, and this one giant named Goliath, who was part of the Philistine army, mocked God and mocked the Israelites. And David, coming to help serve his brothers, 
on the battlefield heard this, and he's like, no, God's not one to be mocked. And so David stands up to Goliath and defeats him, this small shepherd boy. It's such a great victory. And, of course, Saul gets jealous and eventually tries to kill David. In fact, David's playing the lyre for him one day, and Saul, out of a fit of rage, takes a javelin and tries to spear him in the head. I mean, imagine playing the harp and peacefully, and then this guy just comes up and tries to throw a spear at you. I'd be kind of freaked out. Um, but anyhow, David flees, and the rest of his early young life is one of a fugitive. But I, I love this story because David's so humble, and he's, he's not going to force his rule or his kingdom to come. He's going to trust in God's power and his will. He has several chances to kill Saul, and we would say rightfully so because Saul was trying to kill him. In fact, there's one scene where Saul goes into a cave while trying to pursue David to relieve himself, and David comes over with his knife and cuts his tunic or cloak off, a piece of it, and as Saul goes out of the cave, David holds it up and says, look, I have nothing against you. Do you see I spared your life? I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Eventually, David is delivered from Saul. Saul and Jonathan, his son, they die during a battle with the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. And David is eventually anointed king of Judah and Israel. But you see, God has been delivering him from, the, from Goliath, from lions and bears when he used to shepherd the flock. He recounts how he used to fight the lions and bears to ward them off. And you see God's rescuing him, keeping him safe, delivering him, and eventually becomes king by patience and by love. And then shortly after, and I want us to look at this too, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is here where we get the Davidic covenant. So after he becomes king, God makes a promise to him. I just want to read the last verse, I mean the first 16 of chapter 7. God promises, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so this is kind of like a, a progression here. We have the, you know, the Adamic covenant and the Noahic covenant that come with Noah, about the rainbow. Then we have the Abrahamic covenant, which Nathaniel was preaching about, about the nations being blessed through a nation, the nation of Israel. But now we have a greater clarity to God's ultimate promise, which is this kingdom that would be ruled by a just and righteous king. And so we're kind of seeing as time goes by what this promise is looking like and how it's going to turn out to be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And I think that's such an exciting thing for David. He, here he's, he's been given the kingdom, and even he brings in the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, dancing victoriously, and then at this, this moment he gets the promise from God, and then right after that he falls, and man does he fall hard. It's just, so, it's just so disappointing when you get to this, all this triumph and victory of 1 Samuel, and then 2 Samuel just plummets. He commits adultery, and then he commits murder. And it seems so sudden. Notice this. David was delivered from all these physical dangers like Goliath, Saul, the Philistines, the people of Israel. But what he ultimately needed deliverance from was sin. He had been delivered from so many physical dangers, but now he really needs deliverance from his own sin and the evil he's caused. And this really is a rescue mission, this story. And I kind of kind of broken it down this way because I, I think what we need to realize is David is not the hero of the story. I know he's like the action hero. You know, if you look at like the, the action book or comic book Bible, right, David's seen as this huge hero and, and he's a really awesome guy. But the fact is God is the hero of the story because he's the one that's going to deliver David. In the same way, we need rescuing from our sins. So there's, there's kind of three things I'm going to broke, it up, broke up this way. The first is the temptations to sin, which is 2 Samuel chapter 11. I want to see what can we learn from David? How can we be aware of this temptation to fall into sin? The second is the grace for sin. So after he falls, I don't just stop there and say, here's all the things you need to be aware of sin. But when we do fall into sin, what can we learn from David? That there is grace. And so chapter 12 is really about seeing how God has provided grace for David. And then lastly, I want to talk about the response to that grace. Psalm 51. He penned it right after Nathan confronted him. And so I'm going to talk about the temptations to sin, the grace for sin in our lives, and lastly, our response to that grace. But I want you to notice, what are the temptations to sin? What are some things we can learn from David about his life? Well, I think we need to be careful that when we think we've made it, that leads to sin. When we think we've made it, that leads to sin. I mean, think of David. He's gone through all of this victory, all, all of this deliverance from God, 
brings in back the ark, gets the kingdom, defeats the Philistines, and he's a triumphant hero, and maybe he got a little too comfortable with who he was. Maybe he didn't think to himself, look, I've been through all of this. I follow God all this way. I've penned all these psalms. Am I really likely to commit adultery and murder? You know, I mean, I'm sure that was in some way what was going through his head, because when you think you've made it, it's going to lead to sin, and that's something we can learn from David. How many of you guys think, ah, you know, I'll never, I'll never commit adultery, I'll never murder? Yeah, oh, okay, we were, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm not going to commit adultery or commit murder. Are you crazy? I'm sure David said the same thing. And how many of you guys are like, I grew up in church, you know, uh, uh, God, is, God has worked so mightily in my life, and, and I'm at such a spiritual level that am I really going to do such things? But David did. Okay, I mean, if Dave, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm greater than David, because when I look at David, I'm like, wow, that's a hard fall. Am I really going to be any better? Am I, really, am I really free? Am I ever off the way, like off the cuff where I don't have to do that? And we, so we have to be careful that we don't think we've made it. Be aware of getting comfortable with your spiritual life. Don't assume you've made it or have spiritually peaked. Don't think that after a spiritual high that you're good to go. You know, pride becomes before the fall, right? You've heard that saying over and over and over again with Proverbs. We need to constantly rely on God. See, maybe David sometime at this point said, do I really need God anymore? Maybe he wasn't saying, I'm going to ditch God, but maybe in his heart he was like, I- I've made it. I've made it to the kingdom. I'm now king. Saul's gone. The Ark of the Covenant's back in Jerusalem. We're good. Everything's fine. But then come to realize he's the one that causes the trouble. We need constant reliance on God. We never make it. The second is that idleness leads to sin. I mean, look at the text. It says in, 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 chapter, one, in, in chapter 11, verse 1, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David did what? He sent Joab and his servants with him. Later on it says, but David remained at Jerusalem. I think it's implied in this text. It says, the time in spring, you know, the time when kings go out, yeah, David actually sent his commander, Joab, stayed behind remained at Jerusalem. So he kind of bucked his, his responsibility and the work he needed to do, his service that he needed to do to stay home. And in that, he became idle. I mean, look at this. It says in verse, in verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. The first thing I thought was that he's a couch potato right now. Like, it's late one afternoon. I mean, you know, some of you guys wake up at like 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. I don't know how you do it. But David, I mean, it says late afternoon. He probably might have been sleeping on the couch. I mean, I don't know. He might have been, I don't know, watching, you know, uh, Jerusalem's Bachelorette. I don't know. Or just chilling out. <laughs> and he gets up late one afternoon. I mean, he's a, he's a bum. He's like a couch potato. Not doing anything because he's not doing his responsibility, right? So he's just idly standing by. I mean, this guy's bored. <laughs> he's obviously getting up, and he's kind of just walking around on the roof of the king's house. Like, ah, oh, you know, I'm just going to kind of walk around the terrace where I can see everybody, you know, kind of like see also what's going on in people's apartments. And then he sees, oh, look, there's a woman right there, and she's beautiful. So he sends for her. Now, I think one of the situations that he made to fall, make him fall into sin was his idleness. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> so David, David was supposed to be fighting with his men, and after all, he was a fierce warrior. Instead of helping his men fight and leading them, as the text implies, he's lounging around back home. Idleness leads to sin. How so? David's first sin, this is important, David's first sin was neglect. It was a sin of neglect. He neglected his service and his responsibility to his kingdom. As a king, he should have been out there fighting with his people, showing his care for them, serving. Not actively serving puts you in a spiritual t- state of thinking only of yourself, avoiding your responsibilities. You're no longer thinking of other people now because you're not actively serving. You're now like, what can I do for myself? So when we, when we neglect our service to one another, when you're not discipling, when you're not reaching out to one another, you're, you're becoming idle in the work that God has given you. How many times do most of us spend time on the computer when we shouldn't, watching porn, when we could spend those two hours helping somebody overcome that sin? I mean, think about all the things that you spend gossiping, slander, uh, sexual addictions, or, or fuming about anxious thoughts or anger 
about somebody else when you could be spending that time worshiping God and helping others. And so this idleness led David to sin, avoiding our responsibilities. And it's not just the spiritual stuff, guys. Okay, it's also the college work. It's your, your work in general. It's the responsibilities like taxes. Yay. Um, that's not my favorite. Uh, it, it's in any of those things. And when we neglect those responsibilities, we're not doing what God has called us to work before us. We can be tempted to be bored and then ask ourselves, what am I going to do? Are you like David, being idle, walking on the roof, looking for trouble? Like, hmm, what could I do? Now, you may not be intentionally looking to commit adultery, right? But you're putting yourself in a situation that can lead to that. Why put yourself in the situation? Why do that? I also want to look, though, at how the fear of consequences leads to more sin. We see in verse 5 of chapter 11, and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. That's bad news for David. He realizes now, oh my goodness, she's pregnant. Uriah, her husband, is out fighting. And, and in a couple of months, everyone is going to know that somebody was with her. And I'm sure room is going to get around that it was me. And this could be bad. He can lose his status, right? I mean, after all, he was the man after God's own heart, right? He also was king. He doesn't want to lose his throne. He doesn't want to lose his title. So out of fear of the consequences, David digs himself a deeper hole. This is extremely important. Hiding or covering up your sin requires more sin, okay? Hiding or covering up your sin requires more sin. When you're afraid of the consequences, you think the solution is, I need to avoid it. And instead of running to God and trusting in him, you're more afraid of your consequences than you are of God. And look where it got David. Okay, adultery is one thing, okay? But then murder? You know how, what would happen if it got word that the king murdered somebody? And that's where he got himself. I mean, that's, that's serious. That he, he, he didn't realize that he should have feared God more than his consequences. Are you afraid of your addictions to be exposed, your slander to be revealed? Are you trying to cover up your sin and trying to hide it from God? You don't, you don't get away with it, guys, okay? I don't get away with it. Nobody gets away with it. It's going to come out sooner or later in the open. And so I, I encourage you guys, take this seriously. That don't, If you're fearing the consequences more than God, you're going to keep on sinning. Now, some of you think, I'm just hiding it, I'm covering it. That's a sin. That's not being honest. You're sinning and sinning. You're, 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 you're just heaping up all these troubles to come. And you're, you're missing out on a relationship with God. David wasn't in communion. It wasn't in relationship with God. There's no mention of him praying to God, seeking God. And so you lose that. I do think, though, that ultimately what really led to this, and this is another point, is lack of faith leads to sin. Lack of faith leads to sin. David never goes to God for help. I was talking, uh, we went out to a conference, me and Nathaniel, his cousin, and Elijah, Keen, who used to be an intern here, and, and Ben, who's a pastor in Olney, was kind of bringing out an interesting point that I didn't recognize, but that the son was born before Nathan confronted David, okay, in chapter 12, which means that for all those months that she was pregnant, he didn't go to God. He didn't go to God once to help him deliver him from his sin. After all those times he relied on God, being delivered from Saul, from Goliath, from the lions and bears as he shepherded his flocks, all those times, and he doesn't come to God for this deliverance? Our lack of faith will lead us to more sin and more sin as we attempt to correct our problems. So here's what the devil does. And this kind of is, goes right back to the, the, the Garden of Eden. The first thing is that the first uh, aspect of unbelief is that we think sin is more pleasurable and more satisfying than God. That's the number one lie. Okay, that leads you to sin. Oh, sin is good. It's pleasurable. It's satisfying. What did the serpent say to Eve? Look how good the fruit is. And also, you're going to gain the ability to know right and wrong, and you get to call the shots and be like God. So being like God seemed more pleasurable and satisfying than following God. So then she eats and Adam eats, right? And then instantly what do they do? They hide away from God. And that's the second lie. Because I've sinned, God's not going to forgive me. There is no grace, and I can't turn to him. And the enemy wins so very well. So you fall into the trap first, and then he flips it around and says, oh, now you are too, you're too sinful. You can't turn back to God. The consequences are too great. You're going to die, and everything's going to go 
the, the smokes. What, what lie are you believing right now? That sin's pleasurable and satisfying? Or are you in the midst of your sin and you're hiding it because you think there's no grace? What does 1 John 1, 9 says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is why there's the second point, because I could have made a whole sermon on this first point of the dangers of sin, but nine times out of ten, I think all of us are in the sin right now, or we've struggled with it. And what we need is grace. And that's what I want to offer you guys today. In chapter 12, we're going to see God's rescue mission of David. What is the grace that we have for sin? The first is God pursues us and never abandons us. In chapter 12, verse 1, and the Lord sent Nathan, sent, key word, sent Nathan to David. So David doesn't pursue God, he doesn't turn to God, but God still comes and pursues him through the prophet Nathan. And I want to read this uh, section real quick, chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hands of Saul. And I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And you shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. It was a very <laughs> intense passage every time I read it. This is, I kind of feel like the climax of David's life. He's been delivered from all these different physical dangers, but now he needs deliverance from his sin. But look how God sent Nathan the prophet to him. The point of this whole series is to show at, at, at what lengths God is going to provide us a Savior throughout many centuries. And we see this over and over and over again. Do you see God pursuing you? Maybe he's pursuing you right now through this text saying, do you, do you have sin in your life? I'm trying to get your attention. Maybe it's in the devotions you've read this morning, or maybe it's the conscience of the Holy Spirit taking you, saying, turn away, repent, repent from your sin. All of us might have some type of sin that we're hiding and covering up, and some of us think, God's not gonna, God's not gonna wanna take me back in. I can't deal with the consequences. I can't deal with the exposure of all I've done. But here God is trying to pursue David, and he also is trying to pursue us, and he never abandoned us. He doesn't abandon you. The second one, and this is actually kind of exactly what Nathaniel was talking about last week, and that is that God uses others to help us. Um, I was kind of struck by the fact that Nathan was someone that God was using. And that's pretty much exactly what Nathaniel was saying <clears throat> in the sense that God used Nathan to correct David. So when it comes to our sin, do we allow other people to confront us? Do we listen to them? Sometimes God is trying to get our attention through others. Nathan was being used by God to point out David's sin. But I kind of want to kind of look at both sides. For, for Nathan, it probably was really scary, right? It's the king. He's going to come to the king, tell him off, 
tell him that his kingdom is going to be divided, that there's going to be warfare in his house, that there's going to be sexual immorality present within his household, and not only that, but his son's going to die. Do you know how hard that must have been for Nathan to have to bring that? I mean, you know, it is King David. If he wanted to kill him, he could have. He didn't have to listen to that. He killed one man. Why can't he kill two? So some of us are on the flip side. Some of us need to listen to our brothers and sisters who are trying to correct us. And God is pursuing us through them. I've had people in my life, my parents, my wife, many friends who come to me and try to correct me. And I think I can be like, no, I don't want to listen to you. Or I can say, wow, this is God's grace for me. Some of you are called to correct a brother or a sister. And of course, it's not easy. Look at Nathan. <laughs> like, I mean, I, it must have took a lot of courage and faith to do what he did. But Nathan was instrumental in the rescue of David. And some of you need to be instrumental in the rescue of another brother or sister. And we need to do it lovingly, gracefully. Because we all are that man. We all have sinned before God. And we don't deserve freedom. Notice, though, that God does take away David's sin. And this is the third thing, the the third point about the grace of God. God frees us from the final punishment. David admits before Nathan they have sinned before God, yet notice Nathan tells David that he will not die. God had freed David from the ultimate punishment his sin would bring, which is spiritual death and separation from God. Do you, do you see this thread of theology kind of strung throughout the series of deliverance? So we have exile, we fall away from God, and then we have deliverance. Notice that in Abraham, when he's delivered from Pharaoh for having to sacrifice his son, when Jacob is delivered from his brother Esau, Right, he has to, he's exiled, he goes away from home, but then God calls him back home. Or how Rahab is delivered from the destruction of Jericho. Or when Ruth and Naomi is delivered from famine and poverty. How David is delivered from Saul. See, the theme here is we're exiled and we need deliverance. We need rescue from our sin. This is the whole theme. This is kind of the overarching arc of the story. How Moses, right, and the people of Israel, of Israel were, were captive in Egypt and then delivered. It's this idea of exile to deliverance. And the, it all culminates in the ultimate deliverance of Jesus Christ from sin and death through his work on the cross and his resurrection. He takes the captivity to set the captives free. So God frees us from this final punishment. My question is, do you know that? You're still living in sin? God's trying to set you free through Jesus Christ from David and his genealogy from his descendants would come Jesus Christ, and he would deliver us from the ultimate problem, which is sin. See, these are all physical, really illustrations of how God was ultimately going to deliver us from what really mattered, which was sin and separation from God. I, I really, really love this story because it's, it's about God's grace. It's about second chances. It's about seeing the goodness and the love of God in David's life. I mean, he was, he was up here, just victorious, triumphant, and then he just falls so hard. And I can relate with that because I, you know, I've grown up a Christian, been in the church, and when I've fallen really hard, sometimes I think, man, I, can't, I went from there to here. But you see, the beauty of it is that it shows us just how loving and graceful God is, how gracious he is. So the third point is, what is our response to grace? The response to grace David penned Psalm 51, says here, right after Nathan confronted him. And we're going to read this psalm. This is after Nathan confronted him and he admitted that he sinned against the Lord. Look at his change of heart. Look at his response. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of salvation. Uphold me with the willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. You good design and your good pleasure, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. That's a huge change of heart right there. When you realize that you're sinful and that you need a Savior. But seeing that deliverance that Christ has for us is so rewarding. And it's, so, it's, 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 a, it's a message of hope. So what should our response be? Well, in verse 1, I think we need to acknowledge God's goodness and mercy. We have to have faith that he is good, that he is forgiving, that he is loving. David says, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, have mercy on me. David knew that it was only based off of God's goodness, character, and love and forgiveness that he would find deliverance. So we have to admit that. If you, if you don't believe that, then you're, you're not going to return to him. You're not going to repent because you don't think he's good. That's instrumental that you believe that God is good and that he is forgiving. The second is we need to acknowledge our sin before God. He says, against you, you only have I sinned. My transgression, my sin is before me. I see it. I know it. You're justified in your words. You're blameless in your judgment. I deserve hell. I deserve not to have eternal life. It's I'm the one, I'm the problem. I'm the enemy. That's a hard thing to acknowledge, but we can acknowledge it knowing that Christ will forgive us, that he's given us a way of deliverance. A third important point, though, is that we should mourn our sin before God. In verse 17, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. I, you know, I ask myself, am I sorry for my, my sin? Like, do I regret it? Am I sorrowful about it? Not about the consequences, but about, like, actual sin. Like, I, I'm, I'm sad that I'm apart from God. So we have that list of consequences, right? The death of David's son, uh, the, the splitting of the kingdom. But then in Psalm 51, what's he sad about? What's his remorse about? Does he say anything about the loss of his son, the loss of, like, the kingdom? You know what he says? He doesn't want God to depart from him. He doesn't want his spirit to be away from him. See, his, his sadness and his fear was losing God. That's what he was afraid of, separation from God. Matthew 3, 5, 3 through 4 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I think we need to have a true heart of repentance. And some of you are asking, oh, I can't force an emotion. Like, how can I force sadness? How can I, how can I force grieving my sin? I've asked myself that several times. And you know what my response is most of the time? I get down on my knees and I say, God, I, I just don't feel sad about my sin. I don't regret it. Can you please give me a heart? that's broken, a spirit that really sees the gravity of my sin, but the deliverance that you've brought to me. And sometimes we need to pray that prayer, but we need, to, we need to have a heart of repentance, a heart that's broken and contrite, because in this, God will comfort us because we desire him. And he won't take away what matters most, and that's a relationship with him. In that, we have to trust God to deliver us from our sin. He says in verses 7 through 12, constantly, over and over in many different ways. Cleanse me. Hide your face from my sin. Cast me not away. Restore to me. Uphold me. Verse 14, deliver me. But I want to notice this too. And this is kind of what I want to end on. Praise God for your deliverance. Praise him. The greatest display of God's grace and goodness is when I see somebody turn away from their sin and repent before God. That's a great testimony. When people see that. Because when I read David, there's hope for me. When I fall, when I fail, when I stumble, I remember God sent his son to save me from that. So when I fall, when I fail, God's going to uphold me. If I come to him and repent to him, 
So I want to encourage you guys tonight that, that you should respond to grace. Acknowledge your, God's goodness and mercy. Acknowledge your sin before God. Mourn your sin before God. Trust God to deliver you from your sin, and then praise God for it. Some of you guys should be talking about your deliverances to other people. I love it when a, when a student comes to me and says, I've been delivered from pornography. I've been delivered from really slandering or gossiping a lot. I've been delivered from fear and anxiety. And when I hear that, and I hear about how hard people have fallen, but how God raises them back up, I think, now that's gospel grace. And that's what people need to see. Because when we act all perfect, when we hide our sins away, what's the rest of the world thinking? They're not where I'm at. I, I, I'm broken. I'm fallen. I need help. But I don't, I don't see a redemption story here. Don't bypass the gospel. The whole point is we've fallen. Let's stop faking it like we don't really have any serious issues. We need to be real with ourselves and real with others because that's a powerful witness. As I close down, the worship team comes back up. I just really want to encourage you guys that there are brothers and sisters around you who want to talk with you and are willing to help you out. And as a staff, that's something I really want to encourage you guys. If you ever need to talk about anything, Nathaniel, Shandy, or me, or Mariah, or even the officer team, and you need help working through some of these things, we would love to pray with you. We would love to talk with you. I want to help you guys. I want to be instrumental in your guys' life. And I hope you guys will want to be like Nathan, instrumental in helping other people find grace. Let's pray. All right, thank you so much for your word. Um, I just pray that you would help us to, to fully realize, God, your grace and your love. Um, I know it's not easy to talk about sins and, and where we're at with them or if we're hiding them or struggling with them. I pray that we would recognize your grace and that we would take hold of it, that we would help others in their journey, Lord, that we would be instrumental in saving um, one another by, by being correcting one another, God, and, and, and being honest. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross to save me from my sins. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, amen.